Good morning, church. It's good to be with you. If it's your first time here, happy new year. Welcome. My name is Scotty James. I'm one of the pastors. Very excited to unpack the word of God with you today. Past several weeks, we've had the family services, so we, we made them a little shorter. So we're going to make up for lost time today. Get comfy. You're going to be here a while. <laughs> I typically don't have, I don't think, could be wrong, I don't think I talk a lot, but I have a lot to say today. We're going to unpack some, some foundational stuff, I think. So keep up. If you have a Bible, let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1, verses 26 to 31 is where we'll be. Also, there's going to be a lot of scriptures that we're going to go through today that I assume are not going to be on the screen because just inspiration came late. And so um, stay with me, you know, do, do your best to follow along. But Genesis 1, verse 26, I'll read it. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. In the 1960s, there was a young boy who had a very unorthodox upbringing. He was raised by a pack of wolves, and due to some, I guess you could say, extenuating circumstances, he had to leave the pack and he had to grow up in the jungle. And during his time in the jungle, he met some interesting characters. He meets this very serious panther who speaks into his life. He meets this very carefree, maybe even irresponsible bear that speaks into his life. He meets this family of partying apes that speak into his life. And throughout his time in the jungle, all of these characters are giving him guidance and direction on what it means to live as fully human. Uh, he doesn't understand what it means to be human, so they're trying to educate him on what it means to be human. So this young man's name is what? It's Mowgli. His story is the Jungle Book, and it's this fun, silly adventure about Mowgli going through the jungle and meeting all these different people. But at the core, I think the movie Jungle Book is quite profound because it's all about identity. Mowgli doesn't know who he is. He's a human, but he doesn't know what it means to live as a human. And so he gets his direction from the world and all of his surroundings. The ape tells him what it means to be human, and the panther tells him what it means to be human. But again, he has no clue how to live as a human being because he doesn't know what he's aiming for. And so the reason why I think that this movie is quite profound is because it's the situation that most of the world, in my opinion, finds itself in. Most of us today don't understand what it means to be human. We don't. We don't understand what it means to live fully in our humanity. We don't know what this thing like, called life is supposed to look like. And so, just like Mowgli, we take our direction and our guidance from the world and our surroundings. The world says life is about this, or the world says that being fully human means living like this. And just like Mowgli, the majority of us, including myself, live somewhat confused lives because we don't know what we're really aiming for. We don't know what it means to be human. And so over the course of the next several weeks, we're going to unpack this question of, what does it mean to be human, or what does it mean to live fully in our humanity? Because there's an abundance of, of perspectives that are shaping us unknowingly, and we need the Word of God to renew our minds and to sort of reframe our vision of what it means to, to live in our humanity. 
And so today we'll, take a, uh, we'll start off by taking a brief look at Moses. So if you have a Bible, flip over to Exodus chapter 33. Or write down Exodus 33, we'll look at verses 7 to 11. It says, now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrance to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent. They all stood and worshiped, each at the entrance to their tent. Verse 11, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. All right, we'll pause there. So in the Bible, sometimes Moses is considered a type of Christ. That doesn't mean that he is a a, a God of any sort, but when you call someone a type of Christ, it means that they are a preview of Jesus. There are similarities in their life that are meant to point you or foreshadow the coming of Christ later in life. So I want to show you a few of these examples straight from scriptures so that you can kind of see where people get this idea that Moses is a type of Christ or a preview of Jesus. If you want to write down Exodus chapter 1, verse 15 to 16. This is the birth of Moses, Exodus 1, 15 to 16. I want you to observe the climate that Moses was born in. It said, the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during their childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see the baby is a boy, kill him. If it's a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Verse 22, then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. All right. So Moses was born in the midst of an attempted genocide. The Pharaoh sought to kill all the Hebrew boys, but God in his grace preserved Moses' life. Okay, so that's Moses' birth. Now let's look at Jesus' birth. Go to Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, or write down Matthew 2, 1 to 3. Matthew 2, 1 to 3, it says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, during the time of King Herod, Mag- <clears throat> excuse me, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who was born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. Let's get ahead of verse 13 now, verse 13 to 16. When they had gone and the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, he said, Get up. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem in his vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. So do you see the similarity? Moses born in the midst of a genocide, but God preserved his life. Jesus born in the midst of a genocide, but God preserved his life. I'll give you another very brief example. Write down Exodus 14, verses 30 to 31. Exodus 14, 30 to 31. I'm going to start moving fast because we have a ton to cover. It says, that day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of Egypt, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. When the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses' servant. Okay, so God brought salvation through Moses to Israel. Salvation literally means just deliverance. And so God delivered the Israelites from Egypt through Moses. Moses was a savior. All right, write down Matthew 1, verse 21. Matthew 1, 21. Talking about Jesus, she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. So God used Jesus to bring salvation to his people to free them from the slavery of sin. One more example, just write down Exodus 20. God used Moses to be the mediator of the old covenant. Write down 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 to 6. 
God uses Jesus to usher in or mediate the new covenant. And so these are just many more examples, but Moses is a picture of Jesus in the Old Testament. He's a type of Christ. But I think Moses is more than just a type of Christ. The Bible said that Moses saw God or spoke to God face to face. That's an expression to show the intimacy he had with God. He spoke to God as a, as a friend speaks to another friend. He had closeness with God. Him and God were, were tight. They, they knew each other. And at first glance, you see that and you think, wow, Moses is a picture of, of being superhuman. I mean, he, he talked to God face to face. But when you take a deeper look at what humanity was created to be, you'll see that Moses isn't a picture of being superhuman. He's actually a picture of being fully human. Like from the beginning of time, God meant to speak with his people face to face. And so Moses speaking with God isn't a special thing. It's actually the original thing. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, God formed Adam. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, God breathed into Adam the breath of life. Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, God is walking through the garden looking to meet with Moses. So there's this intimacy, there's this closeness, there's this fellowship that Moses, excuse me, that, that, that Adam experienced with God from the very beginning. And Moses' relationship is somewhat of a, of a reflection with that. And so when you consider, okay, what does it mean to be human in its fullest, truest form, to be human is to be in right relationship with God and close to God. That's what it means to be human. To be human is to be connected to your creator and close to him. And listen, and anything less than that is actually subhuman. Let that sink in for a moment. It's not superhuman to be close with God. It's subhuman to be not close to God. If you're not close to God, if you're not drawing near to God, that's actually a lesser experience of your humanity because from the start, you were made to know God face to face and be tight with him. So to be human is to be near to God and anything less than that is a lesser experience and that's the exact opposite message the world and your surroundings give you. The world says the closer you are to God, the lesser of your humanity you will experience. God doesn't add to life. God does not complete life. God actually takes from life. God taints life. That's the message of the world. To live in debauchery, to live in wild partying, to be sleeping around, to be doing whatever you want, whenever you want. That's to live in your full humanity, but to pray or to submit to God's laws or to restrain yourself, oh, that's, you're a goody two-shoe now. You're living a lesser experience now. You're not living to the full. That's the message of the world. And there's a man in the Bible named Asaph who, who struggles with this conundrum. He struggles with this, he sees people living far from God and it seems like they're, like they're winning and he struggles with this. Okay, write down Psalm 73. I want to walk through this. Look into the heart of Asaph and the struggle he has. Is Psalm on the board? Okay, good. So at least we have that. Okay, I'll read it. Asaph says, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They're not plagued with by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? This is what the wicked are like. Always free of care, they go on amassing wealth. Pause. Asaph is struggling with what he sees. He sees people living far from God, and it looks like they're winning. It looks like they're living fully in their humanity. They do whatever they want. They have no restrictions. They're free of care. They're free of concern. They amass wealth. Why? Let's keep reading. Look at verse 13. Look at what he thinks about himself now. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure, 
and have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I've been afflicted, and every morning brings new punishments. And if I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. Look into his heart. He's believing the lie. He's saying, man, being near to God is less than. Being near to God is a, it's a lesser experience. They're living fully in their humanity, and I'm living less somehow. Anyone ever experienced that? Man, the world gets to do whatever they want to do. They get to party, they get to have fun, and I'm stuck being a Christian. They're at the beach on Sundays, and I'm stuck at church singing songs I don't even like. They do whatever they want, and I have to pray, and I have to read the Bible. This is what, this is what Asaph is experiencing. This is the conundrum. This is the struggle he's, he's wrestling with. Look at verse 16. We're going to see something change in him now. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. Till I entered, entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. Surely you placed them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. They're like a dream when one awakes. When you arise, Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. See, Brother Asaph's coming to his senses now. He said, when I went to the sanctuary, then I understood. Now he's having clarity. When he took his behind to church, he started seeing accurately. He had to come near to God. And now that he's starting to see clearly, he's realizing that's a less than life. Being far from God is not better. It's worse. Being far from God isn't good. It's, it's, it's bad. That's not superhuman. That's actually subhuman to be far from God. And now that he has this clarity, look at how he ends the psalm. Some of my favorite verses in Scripture. Look at verse 21 or verse 22. He says, I was, a sen I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near to God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. How good is that psalm? As for me, it is good to be near to God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. God is my portion. God is the strength of my heart forever. Asaph realized to be fully human is to be near to God. And when you look at his relationship with God, there's this closeness I think all of us would desire to experience. And when you look at Moses, there's this closeness with God I think that all of us would desire to experience. But the question is, how? How do we experience this intimacy and this closeness with God so that we can realize the fullness of our human experience? Now, there's a several layers about intimacy with God that I want to unpack Again, we're going to try to move relatively quick, so, so keep up. It's about, I don't know how many we'll get through, but again, these are the layers to intimacy. I'm struggling saying this word, intimacy with God, all right? So write down uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Talking about intimacy with God. Listen, to the word listen for the word reconciliation. How often are you going to hear this word? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... The new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting sins, people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Write down Romans 5, verses 9 to 11. Romans 5, 9 to 11. Listen for reconciliation. Since we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, 
through whom we now have received reconciliation. Talking about int intimacy with God, here's the first thing to write down. Intimacy with God comes, is made possible through faith in Christ. Intimacy with God is made possible through faith in Christ. You might also want to put only through faith in Christ. Step one of experiencing int intimacy with the Lord is through putting your faith in Christ. In the Garden of Eden, mankind's relationship with God was fractured because of sin. And that fracture can only be healed and made whole through faith in Christ. What was lost in the garden was regained in the cross, and the only way you receive that is through faith in Christ. There is no reconciliation with God apart from faith in Christ. There is no drawing near to God apart from faith in Christ. You are saved by grace through faith in Christ, nothing else. You're not saved by believing in God. That ain't God, that's not how it works. You're saved through faith in Christ. That is step one of intimacy with God. However, closeness with God is conditional. This is the next one to write down. Intim intimacy with God, or a better word I would say is closeness with God, that's conditional. This is seldom talked about, and I'm going to choose my words very carefully, because if you confuse this, you run the risk of, of thwarting the gospel. So I want, to, I want to try to be very clear about this. No effort, no good works, no scheme of man makes you right with God. You're only made right with God through faith in Christ. That's it. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And that relationship with God is secure. So God doesn't love you more or love you less based on what you're doing. So when you're doing well, and you've made it to church four weeks in a row, and you've memorized the catechism, and you've put some money in the offering basket, God does not love you more. And when you're not doing well, when you haven't made it to church in several weeks and you sat on the couch and just turned it on, or when you haven't done your Bible reading, or you were unkind to your parents, God doesn't love you less. God's love for you is secure and unconditional. But closeness with him is not. Closeness with God is not unconditional. There's actually conditions to that. Again, it's rarely talked about, but I think the Bible clearly teaches it. Your willingness to obey and surrender to God will affect your degree of connection to him. I'll repeat that. Your willingness to obey and surrender to God will affect your, your connection, the degree of your connection to him. Any relationship, if you violate that relationship and disrespect that relationship over and over again, willingly, distance will happen in that relationship. It is the same thing with God. If you willingly, knowingly violate your relationship with God and step all over his commands and don't repent of that, distance will form in your relationship with God. Write down 1 Samuel chapter 4. I want you to see this with your eyes. First Samuel 4. You can look at verses, I'm going to skip around, but pretty much if you want to write it down, verses 1 to 11. These are the Israelites. They're God's covenant people. God gave them a law, and if they obeyed the law, they would relate right to God. They'd have a good relationship with him. But they didn't. They practiced idolatry. Their leaders were evil. They violated their relationship over and over and over and over again. And look at what happens. In verse 1, it says, Now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. The Israelites camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Aphek. Verse 4. So the people sent men to Shiloh, and they brought back, to the, Ark of the, they brought back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Almighty, who was enthroned between the cherubim. And Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. Verse 10, so the Philistines fought, and the Israelites were defeated, and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. And this is the most important part, verse 11. The Ark of God was captured, and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. Okay, so understand what just happened. The Ark of the Covenant was the visible sign that God's presence was with his people. 
So when you saw the Ark of the Covenant, that means God is with these people. He's near to these people. When the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines, it was the visible sign that God was no longer with his people in the way he was. God was distancing himself from them. God was removing his favor and removing his blessing from them. Now, God was still in covenant relationship with them. He eventually rescues them. He eventually forgives them. He eventually restored them. But for the time being, God says, I need some space. You have violated the covenant over and over again. You have disrespected me over and over again. I'm not going to allow you the intimacy that you once enjoyed. I'm going to remove my presence, remove my face from you so that you can see what that feels like. Still loved him, but intimacy was, was fractured by their disobedience. I'm going to show you another example. Write down Judges chapter 16, verse 20. Judges 16, verse 20. This is the life of Samson. Samson was a mighty man. God empowered him to do great things. God's presence was with him. And that's why Samson was able to do all the things he did. But Samson was a wild child. Samson did whatever he wanted. Samson stepped all over God's laws and violated his relationship with God over and over and over again. Disrespected God. And so one day, Samson is hanging out with a girl he's not supposed to be hanging out with, Delilah. And he tells her the secret of his strength, which he was not supposed to tell her. Violated God's law again. And the Philistines come upon him. And he thinks, you know what, I'm just going to destroy them like I've always done because God is with me. But look at what happens. Verse 20. Judges 16, verse 20. Then Delilah called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know... The Lord had left him. Then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza. Binding him with bronze shackles, they sent him to grinding grain in prison. You see that? Closeness with God is not unconditional. God removed his favor and distanced himself from Samson. Now, later on in the story, God restores him and gives him strength to, to do his greatest feat. But in that moment, God said, I'm removing my blessing from you. You're not going to see my face the way you used to see it because you have disrespected me. If you want more examples, you can write down Deuteronomy 28, verse 15 and 19. You can write down Numbers 14, verses 41 to 45. All of those are examples of this sort of thing happening. Again, I want to be clear. God still loved them, still remained in relationship with them, but their relationship and the intimacy was hindered by their lack of obedience. Here's the next one you want to write down if you're talking about int intimacy with God. Intimacy with God is tainted by sin. Intimacy with God is tainted by sin. It's probably not going to be on the screen. It's ruined by sin. It's, it's affected by sin. Uh, go to James. I don't know if we have James on the screen or not, but write down James 4, verse 7 to 10. Okay, I'll read it. I don't think it's on the screen. James says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Listen, come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So James is talking about coming near to God. But notice, drawing near to God is sandwiched between resisting the devil and washing your hands of sin. You see that? So the point that I'm trying to make is that sin matters. Yes, your salvation is secure, but if you want to experience a close relationship with God, you can't just do whatever you want. And those who live under this fallacy of me and God are good, but I'm living in unrepentant habitual sin, you and God aren't good. You're not experiencing the fullness of your, of your humanity like you could because you're not repenting. Confession and repentance are vital for Intimacy with God. Next one to write down regarding closeness with God. Intimacy with God is more than knowledge. I don't know if that'll be on the screen or not, but write it down. Intimacy with God, closeness with God is more than knowledge. This is a, another mistaken concept. Write down John chapter 5, verse 37 to 40. 
John 5, 37 to 40, which I'll read. This is Jesus talking. He says, and the father who sent me has testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. You refuse to come to me to have life. Okay, so Jesus is speaking with some Pharisees. Pharisees were men who knew more of the Bible than 99.9% .9 of people today walk on the earth, including myself. And yet Jesus says, you're not close to God. So think about that. They have more Bible knowledge than anyone you can imagine. And Jesus says, you're not close to God. Information doesn't necessarily mean closeness to God. He said that they studied the scriptures, but the scriptures did not dwell in them. So they, they, they read the scriptures, but they did not experience the person that the scriptures pointed to. Reading the Bible, it can't be overstated how vital reading the Bible is to the Christian life. You will never hear me undermine the Bible or preach against the Bible in any way, shape, or form. Like, it, it, it is your daily bread. It is your source of life. However, reading the Bible is not the goal. Do you understand that? Reading the Bible is, is a means to the end. It's, it's, it's not the end. It's not about just reading words on the page. It's about being transformed through the person that the pages point to. Write down James chapter 1, verse 22. It won't be on the screen. James says, do not be merely hearers of the word, doers of the word. Do what it says. And so information can lead to intimacy with God, but it doesn't automatically lead to intimacy with God. The scriptures can facilitate that intimacy, listen, when it's applied by faith. That's the next one. Won't be on the screen, but write down. Intimacy with God is experienced through faith. Intimacy with God, closeness with God is experienced through faith. All intimacy is rooted in trust. All intimacy. Human intimacy as well. If you have intimacy problems with your spouse, with your children, with your coworkers, with your friends, with whoever, at the core, there's a trust issue in there. Always. Because when you trust someone, you allow them to be close to you and near to you. You feel safe with them. There's, you, you can't have intimacy, you can't have closeness without trust, without faith. That was the issue of the Pharisees. They knew the scriptures, but they didn't dwell in them. In other words, they knew the Bible, but they didn't trust the Bible. They didn't apply the Bible. James chapter 1, verse 22. Don't be merely hearers of the word, be doers. What does that mean? Don't just hear the word, trust the word, so much so that you apply what the Bible says. And so the people who experience intimacy with God are the people who are willing to display deep measures of trust in God. Look throughout the scripture. Moses saw God face to face. Close, right? You better believe Moses displayed some trust, confronting Pharaoh 10 different times, right? parting the Red Sea, living leading 20 or 2 million Israelites out of Egypt, like he had a lot of dependence on God. Jesus, the perfect picture of intimacy with God. He says him and the Father are one. That's as intimate as you can be. Jesus is also the perfect picture of faith in God. So much faith, so much trust that he went to a, a cross to pay for the sins of mankind. And so if you want to come nearer to God, you must be willing to display trust in God. There's an author by the name of John Bloom who spoke on this. I want to quote him. He says, intimacy with God often occurs in the places where you must trust him the most. That's good. Intimacy with God often occurs, closeness with God, often occurs in the places where you must trust him the most. This is tough for us, as I've said in the past, because we're wired to try to arrange our lives. I'm generalizing but we're wired to try to arrange our lives to where we can trust God less. Like if I could just not trust in God for anything, oh, that would be amazing. No one would ever say that. When you look at how we live and what we 
tend to pursue, that's kind of at the core of what's going on in our soul. That's fine, but it's going to be hard to be close to God if you never depend on him for anything. Another piece about that, sometimes the, the, when you have to trust God the most, not always, but it's in trials. And so trials aren't just negative. Trials are actually an opportunity for us to draw nearer to God. We don't go looking for trials, but we realize that, wow, there's a, there's a real blessing in this trial. If it's going to draw me near to the Father's face, oh, this, this can be redeemed. And you look at the people in the Bible, those who were closest to the Lord, they had some trials. But those trials were opportunities to express greater measures of faith and trust in the Lord. So we shouldn't necessarily run from these trials. We should, when they come and they're outside of our control, embrace them and let them draw us nearer to the Father. Next one, write down. Intimacy with God takes time and patience. Intimacy with God takes time and it takes patience. Two things we don't have in our culture. I'm not talking bad about our culture, just keeping it real. We don't have any time. We don't have patience. We are, I was just talking to someone earlier about this, we are the on-demand generation. You have everything you want at the snap of a thing. You can eat any food you want in the world within minutes, delivered to your doorstep. You can have any form of entertainment at the click of a button. When I was growing up, you had to have the TV guide. Anybody know the TV guide? And you had to wait until a show was aired. And if you missed it, that was it. There was no catching it a second time. Or if you wanted to hear a certain song, the only way you could hear that song is if you bought the, the cassette. Or if you wanted to get it, you had to wait for it to play on the radio. And then you put like a, a blank tape in there. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And you press record right when it comes on. That's what it was back then. Now, you want a song? You just get on your phone. You download it in seconds. You want a TV show? You just watch it in seconds. You want your religion. We even have our religion on demand. I can sit at home at 10 a.m. on the comfort of my couch and watch any pastor in the country with my popcorn in hand. We are the on-demand generation, which is fine, but we have to understand that if we're not aware of that, that can be very detrimental to our soul because intimacy with God does not come on demand. If you want to know the Lord and see his face, you better be willing to wait a little time. Stillness, seeking the Lord, waiting on the Lord. This is vital if you want to draw near to God. You can write down Psalm 27, 14. Wait for the Lord. Be strong, take heart, and wait for the Lord. Write down Psalm 5, 3. In the morning, Lord, I seek your face. In the morning, I lay my request before you and wait expectantly. You got to wait. You write down Psalm 4610. Be still, cease striving, and know that I am God. Write down Exodus. Exodus 24. I want to read this one for you. Exodus 24, 12 to 18. Yeah, it won't be on the screen. Okay, Exodus 24, 12 to 18. Oh, is that right? Yeah, it is right. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and stay here. I will give you the tablets of stone and the law and the commandments I have written for your instruction. Then Moses set out with Joshua his aid, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. He said to the elders, wait here for us until we come back to you. Aaron and her are with you, and anyone involved in the dispute can go to them. Verse 15, when Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days the cloud covered the mountain, and on the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went up to the mountain, and he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. We know nothing about this kind of stillness. Nothing. I don't know if you caught it, but in verse 16, let me read it again. For 15, for six days, the cloud covered the mountain. 
And on the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses. God made him wait six days before he said anything. He's sitting there. This isn't just a a fable. He's sitting in the presence of the Lord for six days before he heard from the Lord. And we expect to hear from the Lord in a five-minute prayer, in a two-minute prayer. It's just not how it works. I'm not saying God can't speak to you in five minutes. I Please don't. But the point I'm saying is that if you want to get to know the Lord face to face, you better mark out some time. You better be patient. You better be willing to wait upon him. That's our challenge. We are so wired to do, do, do. We don't know how to be. We, stillness, silence, patience, we know nothing of. Tasks, checklists, accomplishments, efficiency, we get that. The problem is relationships and intimacy aren't efficient. They're actually inefficient. If you want to get to know someone, that's going to take time it's going to be ineffective. Think about God making Moses wait six days before he spoke seven days. That's very inefficient. But if efficiency is what drives our spirituality, you will have a very shallow spirituality. We know how to do. We don't know how to be. And that's at the core of our issue. We know how to do human things, but we don't know how to be human beings. You're a human being not a human doer or a human doing, doer, whatever. And so when you spend time with with God and you sit before him and you mark that time out and you seek his face through patience, something happens within you. God makes you whole. And this is the final point that I want to make. Intimacy with God produces wholeness. Intimacy with God produces wholeness, if you want to write that down. What do I mean by that? The human psyche, the human soul, there are needs that every soul has. If you look at young kids or babies, I think you can learn a lot about the human soul because babies haven't, sometimes they haven't been like socialized or or messed up yet and so really and so what you see in like a one or two year old kid again they're they're sinful too but you can learn about the human soul from observing a one or two year old kid for example every baby one or two years old needs love every baby needs affirmation every baby needs validation every baby needs to belong every baby needs security right and these are real needs these aren't just made up things if a baby doesn't have love or have attention or affection they'll grow up dysfunctional and 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 very unhealthy. Now, as they get older, they still, we still have those needs. And by the way, the family unit is supposed to meet those needs. So the baby is supposed to receive that love that, that, that their soul needs from their family and that validation and that affirmation, all those things. As you get older, oftentimes what tends to happen is you still have those soul needs, but you seek to have them met outside the family unit. You start to seek to have these needs met for belonging and affirmation and validation from peers. This is why peer pressure is so dangerous, so dangerous, because you literally have these needs. These aren't made up things. You have soul needs, and you're so desperate to have them met. If you connect with the wrong people who are meeting those needs, but they're dysfunctional people, you're going to get wrapped up in the wrong stuff. That's why kids are whisked whisked away. And over the course of time, as you get older, you still have those soul needs, and you start to try to have them met by the opposite sex. Again, this gets you in all kinds of trouble if you meet the wrong person. And so we go through this through life, and we, we're, we're seeking to have these soul needs met by people. It's very easy to be judgmental about why is he or she in this dysfunctional relationship? or why? It's very easy to be judgmental. But when you realize that these are real soul needs that they're seeking to have met, I'm not saying it's right, but it explains a lot about it. Okay? Are you following me? This is the path that most people are on. The problem with that path, though, is that when you seek to have soul needs met by people, you develop unhealthy relationships with people. People are sinful. People are frail. People will fail you from time to time. So if your soul needs, or if you're seeking to meet your soul needs from people, 
family members, friends, spouse, children, parents, what will happen is that you will end up disappointed, frustrated, bitter, and angry because they're not giving you what your soul is desiring. And what should have happened is somewhere along the way, the family unit should have taught you how to have those needs met in God because only God can be the one who makes your soul whole and makes your soul complete. He's the only one who can truly meet those needs. And when you seek to have those soul needs met through people, you develop an unhealthy relationship with those people. God needs to meet those needs. All the needs that we have, validation, affirmation, belonging, love, we have those met in God. And I think we all know that, like cognitively, but it doesn't always register. Like we know that God loves us, we know that we have affirmation in him and all this kind of stuff, but we still tend to be enslaved and seek it in people. So what's the disconnect? I know this, but I'm not experiencing that. I'm still not secure. I st this isn't enough, I still need this. So why is that? I don't know, but I do have a opinion, okay? If you don't mind, go back to Psalm 73, verse 25, 26. This is what I've landed on. So take it for what it's worth. The psalmist says in verse 25, he says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So the psalmist says, who have I in heaven but you? In other words, the greatest thing about heaven is God. And earth has nothing I desire besides you. In other words, the greatest thing about earth is what? Is God. So God is the strength of his heart and his portion forever. What I want you to see is that the psalmist treasures God. God is his greatest treasure. There's nothing greater than God according to the psalmist. And look at what, when, when he treasures God to that degree, look at what his response is, verse 28. But as for me, it is good to be near to God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. He's made the Lord his refuge. A refuge is a place you run for security. A refuge is a place that you run to preserve your wholeness. You see that? Like if I run to a refuge, I'm trying to protect myself and keep myself whole in some way, shape, or form. And so all of our needs are met in God, and we will run to God as our refuge when we treasure him as our refuge. When we treasure God above people, then we will find our needs met in God instead of people, and now that will allow us to relate to people in a more healthy way. We're not needing them for things. We're not needing them to complete, this, to complete us. We're not needing them to make us whole because God has made us whole and we're secure in him. That does not mean that we don't need people. We still need people. So I'm not trying to say like you don't need, you need people, but if you crave the validation of people more than God, or if what God says about you isn't enough, you're not secure enough in that, or if belonging to God's family isn't enough, or if God's love isn't enough and you're still desperate for love outside of that and you need it to, in people, that probably means that you treasure the affirmation of people more than the affirmation of God. You treasure the love of people more than you treasure the love of God. It's not bad if you enjoy people or if you appreciate their love. That's all good. But if you're desperate, if, if, if it coming from God isn't enough, you really need to evaluate your heart and say, maybe I, maybe I treasure people more than I treasure God. And when you look at some of the things that Jesus says, you'll start to realize, oh, he wants me to treasure him above all else. Write down Luke 14. Uh, I don't, Luke 14, it won't be on the screen. Luke 14, 25 to 26. I'll paraphrase it. Jesus says, to be my disciple, you must hate your father, hate your mother, hate your brother, hate your sister. Does he really mean hate them? No, it's hyperbolic language. He's saying, your love for me should be so great, it's as if you hate other people. Like, there should be such a contrast that it's as if you hate people. He wants you to treasure him above all else. Write down Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. 
Love the Lord your God just a little less than you love your brother and sister and your wife and your spouse? Or just a little more? No. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. He wants you to treasure him above all else. Right now, Philippians 121. For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. What is the Bible teaching us? The Bible is teaching us God wants us to love him and treasure him above all else. And when we begin to treasure him above all else, his validation and his love will make us secure and we don't have to be desperate for it for people. We can receive it the way it was meant to be received with appreciation, but we're not in desperation and enslaved to it because we already have it here. And now they're not our God. And now we're not leaning on them for stuff they can't provide because we're getting it from the one who can provide it for us. As long as you treasure people above God, your security will be fleeting at best. And so as we sort of wrap up, the question is, are you living your, human, your humanity to the fullest? Are you experiencing closeness with God? It starts with, have you had your sins forgiven? Have you put your faith in Jesus? Have you cried out to him in saving faith, believing that his death on the cross is the only thing that can reconcile you back to God? If you have not done that, put your faith in Jesus. No good works can reconcile you back to God. It only comes by grace through faith in Christ. But if you have put your faith in Christ, are you experiencing the closeness that God desires you to experience that's available to you? Are you willing to be patient and wait? Are you willing to mark out your schedule to sit before the Lord? Are you willing to get up early? Are you willing to go to bed a little bit early? Are you willing to make a sacrifice to sit before the Lord and seek his face? Are you expecting people to be your validation? Or are you really receiving it from the Lord? Are you treasuring what God says about you more than what people say about you? Are you treasuring God above all people in your life? Again, spouse, brothers, sisters. Are you expecting people to complete you or does God complete you? Really reflect upon these things. Are you experiencing your humanity in full? Too many of us settle for less. There's so much more. Don't settle for a subhuman experience. Settle for the full human experience. And living fully means being reconciled back to God and drawing near to him. Holiness and wholeness. You're going to hear me talk about this a lot. Holiness, holiness allows us to draw near to God. And when we draw near to God, wholeness happens as a byproduct. And so our, my passion for this year, I want holiness and I want wholeness. I want to put sin to death. I want to be separated from sin. I want nothing sinful that this world has to offer. And I want to be made whole in Christ. Because if you really want to reach the world with the gospel, that's what reaches them. Being whole, being holy, being set apart for the Lord's purposes. That's what stands out. So let's pursue holiness and wholeness by grace through faith in Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. But as for me, it is good to be near to God. Lord, help us experience that. Let that not just be words. Let that be what all of us experience. Help us to, to feel what it is to be near to you. Help us to realize that we can be made whole, that the insecurities that we have or the shame that we have or the brokenness that we have, and all of us have it, that can be healed through drawing near to you. If we would treasure you above all things, we could move toward health and wholeness. Please give us this sort of faith. Please change our hearts. Our hearts are not naturally inclined to treasure you above all things. My heart is not naturally inclined for that. My heart is prone to wander, but my heart has been redeemed in Christ. Help us to experience that, to, to live in that, to know that. Please do this in us as a people. Make us holy, make us whole, heal us, God. Expose, expose in us the brokenness, the sinfulness, and heal us this year. 
Help us live fully in our humanity. And as we unpack this stuff over the next several weeks, again, may you birth in this church a people who are, who are being made whole. All that others might see that, see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. We want to we be made whole so that other people can be made whole as well. Please do these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody, everybody say it together. Amen. 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 Let's all stand. Give God some praise as we close. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. If you are new, again, glad you're here. Stop by the Welcome Center. We have a little gift for you. We'd love to get to know you. If you need prayer for anything, our prayer team would love to pray with you. If you haven't put your faith in Christ and you're wrestling with that, talk to myself, talk to Pastor Matt, talk to the prayer team. Let us help you process that. And again, I, I just want to in, encourage you as you go throughout this week, this, don't, don't feel condemnation or anything like that. Really take some of these questions that we just talked about and pray about these things. Lord, is there... Do I treasure you above all else? Or am I making enough time for you? Or Because ultimately, you're blessed by intimacy with God. Not, I mean, he, he likes it too, but you're the one who's made whole in that. You don't have to, we don't have to live broken. Like, we can actually be made whole, but it, but it only comes through faith. So reflect upon these things. Let God transform you. And uh, God bless you. Happy New Year. We'll see you next week.